Okay, I want to pick up in the two towers at the beginning with the chapter of the departure of Boromir. So turn in your books to page 414. This is when um, Aragorn runs up and finds Boromir and Boromir is dying. And Boromir tells Aragorn, I tried to take the ring from Frodo. I am sorry I have paid. And he goes on and tells Aragorn, uh, to go on to Minas Tirith and save my people, I have failed. And Aragorn replies, No, you have conquered. Few have gained such a victory. Be at peace. Minas Tirith shall not fail. Now what does it mean when Aragorn says, You have conquered. Few have gained such a victory. I think what he is saying is that Boromir finally overcame his temptation of the ring. That when he goes back and he attempts to rescue Mary and Pippin, he's showing his contrition for the act of trying to take the ring, um, but then he also dies. He sacrifices himself for the other two, okay? Boromir dies. They bury him. They put him on the ship, send him off, and then Legolas, Aragorn, and Gimli give chase to the orcs, and they keep running, and they go quite a distance, and as they see the riders of, the, of Rowan coming up upon them, they huddle down on the ground. They've got their elvish cloaks on so that they look like rocks. They're disguised. And as the riders get almost all the way past them, we hear Aragorn suddenly stand up and say, What news from the north, riders of Rowan? And the riders encircle them and point their spears right at their chests. And one of the riders calls out to Aragorn and asks, Who are you? And Aragorn tells him his name, since I'm called Strider. I came out of the north. And then this rider says to Aragorn, Strider, that is no name for a man that you give. And strange too is your raiment. Have you sprung out of the grass? How did you escape our sight? Are you elvish folk? And so when he says that's a strange name and have you sprung out of the grass, he's kind of saying... Are you, are you fairy tales? Are you not real? And Aragorn goes on and says, No, only one of us is an elf. He says, But we have been to Lothlorien, and the favor of the lady is with us. Well, that causes this writer, who we later come to know as Aylmer, causes him some, uh, some surprise and fear. And he talks about Galadriel in a way that angers Gimli. And Gimli stands... And says, give me your name, horse master, and I will give you mine, and more besides. And the writer says, I am named Aelmer, son of Aelmon, and I'm called the third marshal of Rittermark. And then, and then Gimli replies to that and says something that is very demeaning. And Gimli says, then Aelmer, son of Aelmon, third marshal of Rittermark, let Gimli the dwarf Gloin's son warn you against foolish words. You speak evil of that which is fair beyond the reach of your thought, and only little wit can excuse you. Now, notice what Gimli's just done. He says to Aelmer, who's got a spear pointed at him, that he's a fool for the words that he uses. He says, you speak evil of that which is fair beyond the reach of your thought. Again, saying, Aelmer cannot even think of or conceive of the fairness or the beauty of Galadriel. And then says, oh, but that's okay, because only little wit can excuse you. It's only because you're too stupid that I won't kill you. Okay. Notice we're told Elmer's eyes blaze. The men get all angry. They advance with their spears. Elmer threatens to cut off Gimli's head if it stood a little higher off the ground. And Legolas says, he stands not alone. You would die before your stroke fell. And we're told that when Legolas says this, he bends his bow and fits an arrow. And what Tolkien implies by that is that Legolas bends his bow and fits his arrow faster than they can even see. So that when Aelmer advances on Gimli and Legolas makes his comment, that suddenly we see Legolas pointing his arrow straight at Aelmer's chest. Okay. Notice things aren't going very well at this point. Aragorn intervenes, says, would you please at least listen to us? Amor says, yes, tell me who you serve. And Aragorn says, 
First tell me whom you serve. Are you friend or foe of Sauron? And Amber says, I serve only the Lord of the Mark. We don't serve anyone else. Okay? And he tells us what the writers of Rowan, in fact, what all the Rohirrim, what all the people of Rowan want. We desire, this is on page 433 in the one volume edition. We desire only to be free and to live as we have lived, keeping our own and serving no foreign lord, good or evil. Okay? That's a very Western notion of freedom. He's saying, just leave us alone. We want all these other powers to just leave us alone. Let us live our lives as we have lived them in the past. Okay? And then he goes on again and he asks Aragorn, Who are you? Whom do you serve? At whose command do you hunt orcs in our land? Notice Aragorn's reply and how different it is than Aelmer's. Aelmer admits he has a lord. Aragorn says, I serve no man. Why? Aragorn has no one who is in authority over him. Aragorn has no lord. He is the lord. He is the future king of Gondor. But then he goes on and says, But the servants of Sauron I chase into any land, they go into. In other words, he is saying, while other lands might regard their borders as secure or as firm, Aragorn says, if I am chasing the servants of Sauron, I go into those borders no matter what the people say. I mean, if you want to talk about the Lord of the Rings and the applicability on the war on terror, he's essentially saying, you know, I'll go into Pakistan if I need to, I'll go into Afghanistan, I'll go into, you know, Kyrgyzstan, I'll go into Uzbekistan, any of those countries. If Al-Qaeda or Taliban, a.k.a. servants of Sauron, are fleeing into those countries. I will chase them wherever they go. And then Aragorn throws back his cloak, and we get this beautiful description. The elven sheath glittered as he grasped it, and the bright blade of Anduril shone like a sudden flame as he swept it out. Elendil, he cried. I am Aragorn, son of Arathorn, and I'm called Elisar, Elfstone, Dunedin the heir of Isildur, Elendil, son of Gondor. Here is the sword that was broken and is forged again. Will you aid me or thwart me? Choose swiftly. This is the first time he's actually done this, where he's claimed all these titles for himself. And notice when he does it, he pulls out Anduril. This is the first time that Anduril is really pulled out, not necessarily in anger, um but as, a, as an exclamation of Aragorn's right and of his lineage. And we're told Gimli and Legolas look at Aragorn now and they see him in a new light. They see him in a new perspective. I mean, this is kind of Tolkien's notion of recovery from the fairy story essay. They are seeing Aragorn as he ought to be seen. And they say, he, the description is that he looks like the figures of Isildur and Elendil that they saw in the statues. And notice that it seemed, we're told at the top of page 434, in the eyes of Legolas, a white flame flickered on the brows of Aragorn like a shining crown. Well, that's the Elfstone. Well, what does Elfstone refer to? The Silmaril. Okay? Because Erendil had the Elfstone. The descendants are called Elfstone, and it's as if Legolas sees this, and this is an indication of the right of kingship. Amir, notice, is, is dumbfounded by Aragorn's comments. He steps back, he casts his eyes down to the ground, because he cannot look Aragorn in the face. And Amir says, These are indeed strange days. Dreams and legends spring to life out of the grass. At the beginning of the novel, we saw Gandalf talking with Frodo, and he says, even in the Shire, hobbits know wives' tales and stories about the necromancer and the, the things of the past. But for them, they are just that. They are just stories. They're only fairy stories and legends. Well, here, Aylmer says, dreams and legends spring to life out of the grass. Why? Because Aragorn showing up and claiming those titles would be like summoning someone coming around today and saying, I am King Arthur, King of Logres, King of Britain. And so 